Right. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's Friday evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Jerry Carwhite. I'm a cardiologist. I uh, run the Inherited Cardiac Disease Service at Guy St. Thomas's and King's College Hospital. Um, and I'm also currently doing a lot of work with NHS England to help coordinate how we get back to normal in cardiology after the, the, the peak of COVID. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to work with Cardamotha UK. It's a fantastic charity, does an incredible amount of, of good work. Um, and I've been asked to, to give a, a short sort of webcast on, on people with, with devices in and how that potentially might change in the, the sort of COVID and, and post COVID era. So, so I'll talk just for about 15 or 20 minutes and then I've got a, a little list of questions that have been sent through. I'll, I'll try and go through those in turn. Um, okay, so, so I think what we'll do is, is just start with just running through and just clarifying that the different types of devices there are and just because how we manage them depends slightly on the device and the complexities. So in order of, of simplicity, probably the, the most simple device we put in as cardiologists is is one of these reveal devices or, or loop recorders. So these are tiny little things that just sit under the skin, um, put in under local anesthetic, takes two or three minutes, and they just act as, a, as one of these halter monitors just to record the heart. They can stay in there for two or three years, and they're really helpful when people have symptoms that aren't very frequent, and you wanna really catch them and see what's going on. And there's two ways that they monitor things. So they, they have set rates, whether it be very fast or very slow, they can pick up um, and they'll do that automatically. But then you also have a little device that you can carry around. And if you get one of your symptoms, a dizzy spell or a blackout, you can just put the little activating device over it. And then most of the time these days, if you do have decent connection at home. All this can be sent through Wi-Fi to, to your local hospital. Um, so that can go through automatically every night. And that way the hospital are just sort of monitoring you through all the time. So, so that's what a, a loop recorder or a reveal device is. Um, I guess the next step up is, is what we would call a simple pacemaker. So this is a pacemaker that you put in just to make sure the heart doesn't go too slowly. And traditionally, these have either one or two leads. Potentially, the most simple one just has a single lead that goes down into the right ventricle. Um, some of them have another lead that goes into the, the smaller chamber, the atrium on the right. So you have a, a little box that sits under your clavicle and two leads that, that go down in the heart. And really, it's very simple. It just counts your heartbeat. And if it goes below a a certain a certain rate, um, it'll kick in and pace the heart. So that's what a pacemaker does. Um, th there are newer types coming through. That there's some that don't involve leads, um, but most of them will will be the little box and leads. Um, that for people with dilated cardiomyopathy in particular, that there's a slightly different type of pacemaker called a cardiac resynchronization pacemaker or biventricular pacemaker. So this has everything a normal pacemaker has, has the two leads into the two chambers on the right side of the heart. But it has a third lead that you put in that goes around the left side of the heart. And for some people with dilated cardiomyopathy, this can resynchronize the heart. So sometimes the heart's really out of sync. And what this pacemaker does is get it all beating together, makes the heart a, a much more a, efficient machine, makes people live longer and improves their symptoms. So that's what a, a cardiac resynchronization pacemaker does. So they're, they're the pacemakers. I guess the next level up is, is the defibrillators. Now they're, they're basically like a pacemaker. It's, it's a box and it's one, two or three leads. They all work as a pacemaker does and stop your heart going too slowly. But on top of that, they have a slightly bigger box, slightly thicker leads, and they can also stop your heart going too quickly. So again, all it does is count your heartbeat. 
but if it goes over say 200 220 beats per minute for maybe 30 40 seconds it'll then try and at times pace it even quicker or if that doesn't work it, it can give your heart a shock to, to try and put you back in a normal rhythm so, so these these are very effective they work very well um, you have to change the, the box and the battery about every eight or nine years. Um, more recently, there's a slightly newer type that's come out where rather than the box and the leads, you just have a device that sits under the skin on the side. Then you have things that are leads that are tunneled into the front of the chest. So this is a, a subcutaneous ICD. Um, but potentially a good thing for young people because once you have these leads in for many years, they can give problems and sometimes you have to take them out, which can be tricky after decades. So it's something that we certainly do think about putting in young people. Uh, the downside is it's not very good or it doesn't pace the heart. So if you're worried about the heart going too slowly, it, it's not a good thing. And if you need that cardiac resynchronization, um, then that's not a good thing either. Um, so they're, they're the common devices that, that we put in. Um, I've seen some, some questions on left ventricular assist devices. So that's, that's the most complex thing um, that we put in. And that tends to be put in only if the heart's really struggling or, or if there are other problems. And what that does it is basically suck the blood out of the heart and pump it back in so it actually physically does the work of the heart for it. And most of the time, the, these left ventricular assist devices are in patients either you're thinking about a, a heart transplant for, and you can't get an organ and things are getting worse, or you think people might be suitable, but then they're, they're not quite well enough yet. And maybe putting the, these LVADs in can then improve things such that they may be suitable transplant. It tends to be people under the age of 65 and just with what's called sort of single organ problems, so lungs and kidneys and liver that, that's reasonably healthy. So, so, so that's a, a very brief overview of, um, of devices. I'll just move on to give you a, a very brief overview of, of COVID and where we are. Um, and I think it's fair to say we're, we're learning every week about this. I think at Guy's and St. Thomas's, we've had the, you know, the, the largest COVID population in the country. We had the first patients coming through and we're still meeting every few days. We're still learning as we go along. Um, I guess one of the first questions people are asking is, you know, how common is, is getting a COVID infection? So we think potentially that if you get COVID, that the risk of, of dying with it is actually quite low. So the, the virology, the epidemiology figures probably come out at, at about 0.1% risk of dying if you have COVID. Um, now, if you take the number of cases we've had in the UK that have died in hospital, that would suggest that 20, 30, 40 million people in the country might have actually been infected. It's probably a little bit less than that, but I think what's very clear is there's a lot of people that have no symptoms, and there's a lot of people that have very, very mild symptoms. Um, and that's the majority of people, I think. When we're trying to work out how common it is, that there's a few, there's a few issues really. So that the swabs, so you have a for those of you that have had it, it's quite unpleasant. You have a swab in your nose and in your throat. Um, and it's not the most pleasant thing to have. But when you have that, even if you do have infection, a third of the time, the swab will be negative. Um, so it's not accurate. And if you've had an infection, two or three weeks later, the swab will become negative. Um, so, so it's a good test and we, we do it a lot and increasingly so, but it's not it's not a perfect test. So if you know if you have a high fever, you feel awful, you've got a cough, um, and your swab's negative, you know if you're not getting better, 
have another swab, have a chest x-ray, just be sure, because because a third of the time that the swabs will be negative. But one of the things we're, we're hoping will will change things is, is antibody testing. Um, but, but so far that's not quite as accurate as we would have hoped. Um, it takes three or four weeks to develop antibodies. But I think if you have mild disease, the antibodies may go quite quickly or you may not even develop significant titers of antibodies in the first place. So I think that there's a lot more work to be done on on accuracy and the epidemiology using antibody testing. Um, so that's that's a little bit about the sort of prevalence of COVID. So I think it's far more common than we think. Um, and I think most people that, that get COVID do, do absolutely fine. Um, in terms of people with heart disease and cardiomyopathies and government advice on COVID, um, there's a small group that are, are shielded by the government. So this is a really small group and these are people that get text every day and shopping and drugs delivered. So, so in terms of what the government has said, this is people who are immunosuppressed, people who've had heart transplants, or um, people who have adult congenital heart disease, not inherited disease, um, and who are pregnant. So, so in terms of the, the people that might be watching this, it really doesn't include, include people with cardiomyopathy. So people with cardiomyopathy aren't on the official government shielded um, list. Um, now I, I wrote a document for NHS London where we added on a, a suggested group that could be considered for shielding. And what we thought that might be would be people with really poor left or right ventricular function, with very high pressures in their pulmonary arteries, and who also had other issues, so were over 70 or had bad lung disease. Um, so, so I think that's the small group that, that should continue probably to, to try and stay um, indoors um, and socially isolated. Um, then in terms of, of other groups with, with cardiomyopathy, um, you know, most people are at relatively low risk. I think those that seem to be at higher risk are those where the, the heart is, is very weak. Um, and, and also those who, who are more elderly and with diabetes and hypertension. So in all the studies that by far the biggest factor that puts risk up is age. So I think if you have cardiomyopathy and you are over 70, I would suggest just for the moment you do continue to, to socially isolate and, and stay at home, I think as much as you can. Um, so, so that's a little bit about government guidelines and what you should do. Um, I think if you're under 50, otherwise well, with a heart that's not very weak and, and not particularly symptomatic, and then I think you're, you're probably okay to, to, to go back to work, provided there's no other issues going on. Um, so, so, so that's a little bit about COVID and prevalence and, and where we are at the moment. I think the other thing that's becoming clear is the message that came from Wuhan was, this is just a single organ disease that affects the lungs. And actually what, what we're seeing now is, is that it's, um, it's a disease that affects um, blood vessels. It affects the liver, the kidneys. It can affect the coronary arteries, can affect the lungs, but doesn't always affect the lungs. And, and in some young people, we're seeing this sort of Kawasaki-like thing where the lungs are fine, but you get the, the coronary arteries and the kidneys and liver and other things are affected. So it's, I think it's a disease that that doesn't always just affect the lungs. It can affect sort of every bits in the body. Yeah. And as someone sort of very sensibly pointed out in their questions, it's, it's a disease that, that affects the endothelium of the blood vessels and makes the blood very sticky. 
So I, I did quite a bit of work on ITU during the peak and lots of clots in the lungs, lots of clots in lines that people had in. So it's it's this hyper, it's almost like the virus causes this hyper inflammatory condition. The virus then settles and it's this hyper inflammatory condition that makes the blood sticky, gives you these different organ problems. So we're, and again, we're, we're still learning day by day on that. Um, in terms of, of risks for all people with COVID, I think, um, as I said, the overall mortality is, is probably about 0.1%. Now, there's a small group that do become unwell and come into hospital, but actually their outcomes are still reasonable. Um, I think if you get so poorly that you come into hospital, it is a really nasty disease. Um, as I said, I think we've got the biggest experience in the country and our figures as of yesterday, I think where if you come into hospital um, survival to leave hospital is about 80%. And actually our figures, even if you go on to our intensive care and you're ventilated, some of people having these ECMO cannulas as well, that our survival is sitting at just over 70% at the moment. So actually even the sickest people with COVID are, are doing okay. Um, okay, so, so that's a little bit about the disease. I, I think certainly in London, the the prevalence is very low now. We're seeing very few new cases coming through. I think with a bit of the sort of relaxing of, of what's happened and, and the Cummings effect, you you may see a, a small second peak, but I really don't think it'll be anything like the, the previous one. Um, so I just, before I go through some more specific bits and questions about devices, I just wanna talk through how we're how we're planning to reinstitute normal services. So, so I think, you know, my message to everyone that's watching is, is we're now in what's called the recovery stage. So we're, we're trying to get the, the NHS back to normal for people with heart problems. Um, and I've just been finishing a document for NHS London today that, that sort of spells out all the different steps we're, we're trying to take. So if we sort of go through it in turn, so if you need to come in for your normal outpatients, or you need to come in and have a, an ECG or a heart scan, an echo done, or an MRI scan, what we're doing at the moment is giving you a ring a couple of days beforehand, just to check you've got no symptoms or that no one in the house has got any symptoms. And then we, we ask you to come up to the hospital. Some people will take your temperature when you hit the front door, some won't. Some hospitals might give you a mask to wear, other hospitals might not. Um, I think what we are suggesting is you try and come with a car or with hospital transport and try and avoid public transport where possible. You, you then come into the, the waiting room where there'll be two meters of social distancing. Um, and then you'll have your tests with people wearing probably just gloves, a, a simple pinny rather than a full length gown and just a simple surgical mask. Um, they'll talk to you, do your procedure. Nearly all the hospitals will see you and do ECG and echo and tests all in a one-stop shop. And then you'll you'll be allowed to to go home. Um, most hospitals, certainly in the area I'm looking after, have started doing that, and that seems to be working very well. Um, so that's what happens with just coming and having your outpatients, and that would apply to coming and having your pacing check and things like that. Um, if you need something a little bit more done, so if you need to come and have a procedure done, if you need a box change for your pacemaker, if you need um, a new pacemaker put in, if you need something that is a day case procedure, maybe a coronary angiogram, what we're going to say is if you're at high risk, so if you have a, a very weak heart or you're elderly, you should self-isolate for, for two weeks beforehand and then 
you should have a, a swab done two or three days beforehand, and then you come in and have your procedure. So the hospitals now have labs for people who are negative for swabs and have no symptoms, and other labs for people where they're not sure if they may or may not have COVID. So, so for these elective procedures, there's a so-called green or sort of COVID protected pathway where you come in and out, avoiding any contact with people that could potentially have COVID. All the staff will be wearing appropriate protection. And what we started doing is trying to do a lot more of these as a day case. So you're in and out in a day. Um, across South London, I, I think we've done about 300 cases like this now. Um, we don't know anyone that's come in and gone out with COVID and the outcomes have been just as good as they always are. So it seems reinstituting this, this elective work is, is safe. Um, if you have a more complex thing where you have to have a few nights in hospital and need a general anaesthetic, it's a similar thing. So isolating two weeks before, a swab two days before. Um, but I think with the more complex ones, no matter what your age and risk, we will insist that that's done. Whereas some of the more minor things, if you're sort of young and fit and well and working, we we may just say do a swab two days before and you don't need the whole two weeks. Um, so that's the precautions for people with um, coming in and having other sort of lab based procedures like defibrillators and things. And certainly across London, you know, we, we report weekly into a pan London group now that the outcomes have been very good with this new way of working. Um, but for people who need other things like heart surgery or these sort of TAVI valves where you have percutaneous valves, again, with, with the new way of working, that, that also seems to be working well. There's, there's a centralised London system for heart surgery now, and there's at the last 300 cases, no one has converted to having a COVID infection. And again, the outcomes is as we would normally see. So, so, so really, I, I think, and you've probably heard it on the, the government briefings, you know, the NHS is open now. And it's, it's, we've got a, a reasonably good and safe system to see people um, who have heart issues. And I think that you know, if you do have the symptoms you would normally access medical care, then I, I think it is safe to do it now. And I think one of the lessons we've learned from Spain and Italy is, is actually the risk from people staying indoors and not seeking medical help is probably much greater than this very, very small risk of, of coming into hospital once hospitals have the, the appropriate setup. So I would, I would encourage everyone you know, who's unwell, that they should come into hospital as normal now. I think if people are due to, to have procedures, um, you know, provided their hospital is, is set up properly and everything's all set up, I think that is now a, a safe thing to do. You know, the, the, the risk benefit will be looked at in every patient. So, you know, where procedures will make you live longer and make you sort of feel a lot better, it's sort of slightly more time critical ones, we're definitely doing all of those. You know, if you're down, perhaps for something like an AF ablation, then your symptoms aren't too bad. And it's not going to make you live longer and you weren't completely sure in the first place, then they're the kind of things that maybe we would be rediscussing with with patients at the moment. Um, so, so that's the general way we're, we're trying to, to institute cardiology recovery. So, so, so please do do access the, the health service as normal. Um, in terms of some specific things with with cardiac devices, so most uh, reveal devices, most pacemakers, most defibrillators should have the option for home monitoring. Um, so this is something that you just have by your bed with Wi-Fi, where you can transmit your pacemaker or ICD check. You can send your, your reveal downloads down the phone. 
So, so if, if you have a device and you don't have home monitoring, um, I really would suggest now is a really good time to have it. You know, it saves coming in and out of hospital. Um, so what I would suggest is anyone who's not sure if they could have it or thinks they might be able to have it but didn't want it before but might think about having it now, I'd suggest maybe you give your local pacing clinic a ring and just ask them um, if there's a way to to set up home monitoring and I think they can send the kit out. I don't think you need to come up and get it. Um, in terms of, it's not quite devices, but, but quite often with cardiomyopathy, you have these halter monitors put on, um, where you have the, the three dots and the thing you wear on your belt for a, a day or two. So, so we, we now got a way where actually we can send these out to you in the mail. So you don't need to come into hospital to have it. You can send it out to you in the mail um, with some sort of simple-ish instructions how to put it on. And then you can send it back by registered post and then that saves you having to come in and out of hospital. Um, so that's a, again a new thing we've we've started doing. Um, in terms of outpatient appointments, I, I think it's safe to be seen and I think if people are poorly they should be seen now. But, but I think there's there's quite a lot of people with inherited diseases and cardiomyopathies who, who we like to keep an eye on, we like to see every six or 12 months, um, ju just to check that there's nothing new, there's nothing different, reassess the medicines and things. What we're finding these days is actually, we can do a lot of these consultations remotely without people having to come up. So, so certainly where I work, 95% of our outpatient appointments were virtual in the, when we had the COVID peak. Um, and we're, we're now seeing more people, but, but I think there's a lot of people who we can now see just with a phone call or with a Skype or Microsoft Teams or a Connect Anywhere. Um, so, so those of you under regular follow-up, you may find that, that a lot of the follow-ups are, are now going to be virtual, which I hope is, is more convenient for you. Um, but I think if you're unwell, or things aren't right, we'll still try and see you face to face. And if you need to come and have your echo scan and things, then we can do that and see you face to face in a in a one stop shop. Um, because of all the social distancing and all the precautions, we're seeing a lot less people in a given space. So, so we're we're using sort of other local community spaces where borrowing space from the private sector. We're going to be working extended hours, weekends and things, I think. So the, the way the health service works, um, I think will change. Okay, so I've rambled on a bit. I'm sorry about that. But that's that's just a little bit of a, an overview of where we are with COVID, the, the whole recovery piece, and a little bit about devices. Um, so, so I think we've got about 10 minutes left and maybe 15. So what I'm going to do is, is just go through some specific questions. Um, just saying there's nothing on the chat, is there? Right, okay. So the first question is, what should people who have been classified as vulnerable by the UK government who have shielded do after the 12 weeks is up? Yeah, so we, we touched on that a little bit. Um, now, the, most people who are staying at home aren't on the official shielded years because that is basically just heart transplants and pregnant women with adult congenital heart disease. Um, but I think there's a much bigger group with you know heart problems who, who quite rightly the doctors have said you should you should stay indoors. Um, now I think and we, as doctors we've all had a lot of questions about this. I think where you're unsure, I think you need to ask the doctor or the genetics nurse or the genetics counsellor or, or the GP that's looking after you because there's not a, a didactic right or wrong here. But the broad brush principles, if you're young with a relatively strong heart with no other comorbidities, then, then you needn't be 
staying at home. Um, if you're over 70 with a heart that's weak or very weak, if you have lung disease, hypertension, diabetes, then I would probably suggest you continue, certainly for the next two or three weeks, just until we get a little bit of a clearer idea whether we're going to get a small second peak. Um, but the risks are, part of the risk is your heart, your other risk factors. But of course, the other part of the risk is, is how prevalent COVID is at, is at the time you're considering coming out. So, so I would take advice from GPs, practice nurses, or the, the heart doctors and the nurses and genetic counselors looking after you. It's, it's a really hard question. Um, and I can't really give any more sort of didactic comments because it'll be such a dynamic thing to answer. Um, and then the next one is our normal checkups um, with cardiomyopathy going ahead. Um, yeah, so, so yes, they are now. Um, most of us have sort of cancelled things for two months while we coped with the, the ITU surges. So there will be a bit of a backlog. Um, and we'll try and prioritise who we see first. So, so they're definitely all going ahead. Some of them will be virtual rather than face-to-face, -face, but only where that's the right thing to do. But otherwise, normal service is slowly being, being resumed. Um, and if things aren't right or you've got worries, you know, please do get in touch. I think a lot of the hospitals have updated their website. So if you're unsure how to get in touch, it should be on the hospital websites. And there should be contact numbers and emails there. Um, those of you lucky enough to have contact details for a genetics nurse, that, that's always your, your best bet to try and contact into hospital services. Okay, um, next question. I read that clotting can be a serious side effect of COVID-19. I'm already taking warfarin. So does that mean should I contract the virus? This is a side effect that I wouldn't experience. That's a very good question. Um, so, so as I said earlier, you're absolutely right. Clots, clots are a big part of, of COVID-19. And certainly from some of the work that's just come out in the last week, it does look like a lot of the clots are, are quite a way down the arteries. So, so we, we are seeing people with clots in their, their pulmonary arteries, the arteries that go from the heart to the lung. And normally when we see these, these are sort of fairly reasonable sized clots in the main sort of vessels. With this disease, we, we're seeing probably lots of little small clots further down. So sometimes the sort of CT scans don't pick them up. It's only using these sort of special dual phase scans that we're, we're starting to see that. And occasionally in, in the heart, we're seeing similar things as well. We're seeing little tiny clots and heart attacks sort of speckled around in, in a small group of patients with COVID. Um, if you are on warfarin, you know, you, you probably are less likely to have clots. Um, and certainly we've got a much lower threshold for using blood thinners if people are seriously unwell with COVID. But again, what, what tends to happen with COVID is you have the viral infection that settles down. And then the next phase isn't the virus, it's your body's overacted inflammatory response to the virus that gives this what's called cytokine storm that makes your your blood sticky so it often comes you know two three weeks down the line sometimes um but yes i mean certainly don't stop your warfarin and, and if anything that, that that might be a really useful thing to, to be on okay next question do you know what the death rate is of people with covid19 who have cardiomyopathy um, in relation to the general population? It's a very good question. It's a very hard one to answer. We, we don't know for sure the, the death rate in the general population because of the reasons I said earlier. We, antibody testing is far from perfect. Swabs are far from perfect. There's a lot of people with, with minor disease. Um, I think those who have the, the higher death rate 
are those who are elderly, with very weak hearts, with lung disease, with diabetes and, and hypertension. Um, and if you have those risks and you have the disease, again, you know, even in the most high risk category, 80% will still do fine. But, but if you have those risks, then your risk of, of dying is increased. Um, but even in that really sick population, they get transferred to a, a very specialist COVID ITU. We're still seeing 70, 75 percent of people surviving. So even in that very high risk group, and that's the very tip of the iceberg, outcomes still aren't, aren't too bad, actually. Um, OK, next question. Does having a sub, I think the S will be a subcutaneous ICD put you at greater risk of death if you then catch um, COVID? I, I don't think it does, actually. I think, um, you know, a defibrillator is keeping you safe from sudden death, which is a really good thing. You know, the, the risks with COVID, again, are, are, is age, comorbidities and how weak your heart is, how high the pressures to your lung are. Just the fact that you've got a device in it really doesn't make you higher risk at all. Um, and maybe for a, a match group might, might even give you some protection actually. So the device itself, no, it certainly doesn't make you at a higher risk. Um, there's a very specific group who, who don't have cardiomyopathy, but who have a, um, a condition called Brugada syndrome. Um, and that's a condition where the heart muscle is fine, but you have problems with the iron channels in the heart. Now in those patients, high fevers um, are a risk of, of getting problems and shock. So, you know, I, I don't know if anyone is watching who might have Brigada, but if, if you do get COVID, you need to take your paracetamol very regularly to, to try and keep your fevers down. Um, and there's some conflicting advice as to whether people like that should go to hospital if they have a fever. I think if they're well, they, they probably don't need to. But that's the one specific group where really getting the, the temperature down would be important. Um, so I have an ICD in, I received a letter from the hospital, the appointment to have this checked. Should I go as planned? Um, so, so, so yes, yes, you should. I mean, the, the first thing to do is to phone the device clinic and say, can you be set up for home monitoring? Can they send you the kit? Can you do it at home? Because that takes away any risk whatsoever. So, so I'd suggest that would be your first port of call. Um, if you can't do that, th then yes, I would say, th then do go into hospital. Um, you know, every visit you should, I think every hospital I know of, you should be getting a, a nurse phoning you up before you go in a few days before, and they will go through all the different precautions with you, check you haven't got any symptoms, you know, make sure you try and avoid public transport, explain how it'll work when you come in. So I, I think as we are at present coming in and having your device checked, the risks of contracting COVID are really very small and they're probably higher leaving the house just to go shopping or, or go out than they are coming into hospital at the moment, I would have thought. Um, yeah, so, so I think, you know, if there is a second peak, the advice probably will change and the, the hospitals would obviously give you advice. But as we are at the moment, I, I think you're very safe coming in, provided your hospital's set up to do it properly. Um, okay. I have dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure. And before the lockdown, my consultant recommended me having a CRTD. Do you think I should contact him and ask him when I can have this done? I'm a bit nervous and to have it done, my heart is at a greater risk of stopping. Yeah, so it's a really, really important, really good question. Um, so, so I think, uh, you know, as I went through earlier, CRTD is one of these resynchronization pacemakers that's also a defibrillator. Um, so, so, you know, in the right patient it is a fantastic thing to have. Um, I think I think now is a, a pretty safe time to, to start thinking about having this. 
Um, what, what most hospitals are doing now is is starting to look at their their waiting list because it will have grown because we cancelled everything for, for two or three months. And our first ask that we've written across London is you look at those who we think need something within four weeks. And actually in that group tends to sit most people that we've said need a defibrillator. So, so those that, that are on the waiting list for defibrillator I think will be some of the first groups to be contacted by hospitals. And again, most of the time now we should be trying to do that as day cases. So you come in with, with private transport, you go in a clean entrance to a clean lab, full PPE with all the staff in the lab and everything, recovered in a clean area, and then you're back out to, to private transport to go home. And in that setting, that's 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 a safe thing to do. And as I said, we've we've had quite a few now come through certainly my area uh, and no one's contracted COVID and and all the outcomes have been good so, so, so I think it it would be a reasonable thing to to have done now um, each hospital will will be in a different phase of recovery in their waiting list so what I'd suggest is maybe contacting the maybe the secretary of the consultant who's looking after you but but I think my advice at the moment would be yes, now now's a good time to have it done. But I would specifically ask if you can have it as a day case, depending on which hospital you're in. Okay. Um, right, where are we now? So my mum who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is due to have an ICD fitted and is getting more and more adamant that she doesn't want it put in as the thought of having something put in her is freaking her out. I've shown her kind of off the UK's book on ICDs to try and persuade her of the benefits, but she's not convinced. So, so that's a that's a really important question, I think, um, and that's something we we see a lot of. I think you know having having a defibrillator, you know, for us as cardiologists, it's it's something we do all day every day. It's a straightforward thing to put in. The risks of putting it are very low, but for the patient, you know, having a thing put in under their skin, having leads going down their body, you know, it can be a very scary thing. So some people are fine with it, but but some people really struggle with the idea of it, um, and that's you know, I think that's a normal reaction. So, so and relatives absolutely understandably just want just want their parents, their brothers, their sisters to be safe. Um, so so we, we do see this dynamic a lot of the time. So, so in terms of, of how we try and address it, you know, it's really important the patient is happy to have a procedure done. You know, what, what you don't want to do as a relative is, is try and push, push someone to have it done and then they just absolutely hate it afterwards. And then we certainly had people we've seen who come back and say, look, I, you know, I don't want this, I want it taken out. So, so, so the patient has to really be happy they want to have it put in. Um, now, if you're trying to reassure people that it is the right thing and a safe thing, often the, the sort of specialist nurses are really good at this. They run clinics, they can talk, spend a bit more time talking you through the procedure, show you what the devices look like. The other thing they can do is, you know, is put you in contact with people that have had them done and they can, you know, reassure you, talk you through it. You know, kind of off the UK and their, 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 all the different bits on their web page and their phone lines, they'll be able to, to help give advice and then maybe put you in contact with people that might be happy to talk you through it if, if they've had it. So I think there's lots of ways, but it's, you know, it's really important that as a patient, you really understand what's involved and you're, you're happy to go ahead. And, you know, it's certainly more frightening for, for some people than others, but you know, I think trying to find a specialist sort of electrophysiology nurse to talk you through it, using Karamoff kind of the UK, talking to people that have 
had it done before and can talk you through and reassure it is it's potentially one top tip for that okay um, so we're almost out of time so we've got one last question so how complicated a procedure is having an LVAD implanted I have dilated cardiomyopathy heart failure and this has been suggested to me by my cardiologist is it a relatively straightforward operation and what is the normal recovery time I think that's yeah so, so that's quite a tricky one to, to, to finish on so, so so if we just talk through the the transplant left ventricular size device sort of process so, so heart transplants is the sort of last resort for, for people with particularly dilated cardiomyopathies um, it's it's only needed in a very very small percentage um, for those that have heart transplants then the outcome is very good now but you know five ten year survival is is very good with heart transplants so in the right group it's it's a really good treatment um, to be eligible you probably have to be under 65 you have to have lungs kidneys and liver that's healthy and you have to be bad enough to, to warrant that so you have to have a very weak heart you have to have, be very symptomatic um, and you have to be on all the right medical therapy for three or six months have all the pacemakers and defibrillators in to optimize everything um, you need to be on the newest drugs and Tresto, etc. So, so that's the small group in whom we would consider it, um, and the same people we would consider heart transplant is the same people we would consider a left ventricular assist device. They, they're sort of packaged that go together because to be assessed for that, you, you can only be assessed at the moment in a transplant centre, really, because it's only really eligible for those that. That could be transplantable um, so, so, so I think that's that's the process um, often as as cardiologists we will if we think people are, are getting worse we'll ask them to be assessed in a transplant center maybe when they're still not too unwell because it's always better to feed people into systems too early rather than too late and miss the boat so so certainly some cardiologists will say, well, look, why don't we just get you seen? I don't think you need anything at the moment, but you're in the system. We hope things don't get worse, but at least we, you know, we've got you assessed and know what's, what the potential options are if things were to get worse. So, so in terms of what your cardiologist is asking, it, it depends whether it's, let's just get you seen just in case, or if they think things have got bad enough, and you could be eligible enough that now's the time to be assessed for that. So, so most of the time to be assessed for an LVAD, you'd be assessed in the same way for a transplant. Um, and that's a whole series of tests, measuring the pressures in the heart, walking on treadmills, bloods, blood group, height and weight. Um, and then if the transplant centre felt a, an LVAD is something that, that would be a, an option, then, then it is a big operation. Um, so you're having quite a quite a big pipe put in the heart, and then goes to a pump, that then goes back into the heart. Um, so you know, and it's a, a proper full stenotomy. So it's a big operation to have. You know, in the right group, the, the sort of perioperative survival is really good, and you're you know you're sort of pretty much recovering and starting to to get around after a week but you know you'll potentially have the the motor you'll have to carry around so um so, so i think the the risks and the severity of the operation very much depends on on why they're putting it in so, so if you are being assessed for a possible LVAD, you you will go to a transplant center and all the transplant centers have just fantastic nurses that spend ages going through all the questions you're, you're asking um, and they spend a lot of time actually giving you far more detailed sort of 
discussions around you rather than me giving you some some broad brush things okay so, so i think time's pretty much up um i hope that was helpful um we, we didn't do live chat because i wouldn't have been able to to multitask um but but i don't know if, if alison or someone wants to just put a message if you have questions that have come up from anything i've said if you want any clarifications perhaps if if alison or or someone put something on the chat or on the web page i'm happy to then sort of answer those and and cut them off the uk can can give the answers and things okay well great pleasure to, to speak to you all um you know i i hope you're all keeping well the the whole covid situation is is changing very rapidly and you know very happy to to update in two or three weeks time when it may be very different so i hope you all have a good weekend um it's very weird talking to yourself without any feedback in a camera for 45 minutes but but i hope it was useful so nice to see you all and, and have a good weekend